be seated. This is a celebration of life of Brother George Curry, Dr. Tommy Lewis of the Bethel Baptist Church in our state evangelism. Chairperson will come now and lead us in our opening hymn. Lord, let us all join in and sing together, praise God from whom all blessings flow. After that, description prayer by Reverend David Gay of the Beulah Baptist Church of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Thank you, Brother President. Brothers and sisters, let's all lift our voices. This is the time that we trust the Lord. If you live life long enough, you learn how to trust God, not always because of, but you learn to trust him in spite of. Tell your neighbor this is one of those in spite of moments. Just go on, turn around and tell them. They don't want to hear you tap them on the shoulder. Come up in here acting like that. Tell them you got to trust the Lord. Tell them you got to learn how to trust God. I will trust. In oh, I trust. Oh, I will trust in oh, until I. Another thing you got to be able to do if you're going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to stay on my bend and oh, I'm going to stay on. Yes, I'm stay on. Oh, until I. Die. Oh, I'm going to stay on my Yes, I'm going to stay on my Yes, I'm stay on my Here's another thing, you got to be able to do this. I'm going to treat every by George Curry, believe that. Treat every Oh, I'm going to treat everybody Oh, until I This is the last call to everybody. I will trust in yes, I trust. You got to trust him. Oh, I will trust in. How long you gonna do it? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, I will trust in the Lord. I, I got to trust in the Lord. I trust. Oh, till I.
his family, I hope you find comfort in the Psalm of David, the 23rd number of the Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, thy comfort me. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. To him that sits high and looks low, we thank thee for all the many blessings that thou hast restored upon us. We thank thee for the life and legacy of our brother, and Brother George Curry, the smiles he brought, the lives he touched, and the memories we all hold. We thank thee for all those who have traveled both near and far for such a memorial occasion. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless our going out and our coming in. Everywhere the sole of our feet shall tremble, we want to be blessed and highly favored. And we'll forever give you the praise and glory. In the name of a risen Christ, we pray. And let our hearts say, Amen. Greetings in the name of Jesus the Christ to this beautiful family and this beautiful audience. We have not come to moan our death, we've come to celebrate our beautiful life. We do welcome home President Charles Steele. Let us welcome. And we welcome to this place in our city, Reverend Jesse Jackson. We have come to celebrate. I know the theologian said, man entered this world naked and bare. He spends his time with trembling and care. He leaves this world, God knows where. But one thing is certain, if you do well here, you will do well there. George Curry has done well here, and he will do well there. The record says, this is the record God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that has the Son has life. That says to me he's more alive now than he ever has been because he trusted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He has moved from the island of time to the continent of eternity and he moved into a city that older than Eden and taller than Rome where there's saints done on the banks of everlasting deliverance waving palms of victory in their hand. No itinerary, no clock, just one eternal day. And we rejoice in this homegoing celebration. Our service called now for tributes, hometown and family, and they're listed on the program. Come as you're listed. You can come, come on to the podium as you're listed. Start with Ms. Mrs. Evelyn Mims, former Druid High School teacher. They will just come. Just come in the order that you are, that you're listed. You can come on. Okay, you can do that. Good evening. Good evening to the clergy, distinguished dignitaries, friends, family, and believers. It has been said that death is simply a short trip home. As a ship leaves its shore, there are those on one side who will see it disappear into the vastness, while those on the other side want to uh, welcome the ship. As we move and mourn our loss, George Curry is being welcomed home by a cloud of witnesses. Let us cherish his memory, however, and give thanks for his good 
and productive life while he dwelled among us. Eighteen years ago, this very month, he spoke at my late husband's funeral. He recalled the relationship they had as football coach and player quarterback. And he shared how that experience continued to impact his life. I remember him George, not as a student athlete, but foremost as a scholar athlete. He was purpose-driven, self-directed, and loved words. Quite an extensive vocabulary. However, he would always remind me that there were four important words in his vocabulary. Start, those words began with D, drew it. He said, you needed to be, what was the first one? You needed to have that drive to become someone. You had to be determined. You had to be disciplined. And you had to be dependable. He also added the word, let's see, I want to make sure that I use the one that he used, dedication. He always said that coach said you had to be dedicated if you were to be successful in life, and certainly on the football field. He was very active in student activities. Member of the student council member of the Honor Society. He wrote for the Dragon's Tale, a school newspaper. He was determined. Mr. Curry, as I say now, because he earned the prefix is a native Tuscaloosian who went on to be known far beyond the city of his birth. His influence was global and he devoted his gifts and talents to righting wrongs and lifting as he climbed. I suspect if the dictionary had pictures to define words, we would find his photo located beside the word voice with a capital V. Not only did he speak his thoughts loudly, clearly, and eloquently, he also especially gave voice to many who had not found their own articulation of their thoughts and feelings. The world will miss him. If we want to honor his memory, let us pick up the baton and continue the legacy he bequeathed us. As a retired English teacher, I would be remiss if I did not look for a description of him in literature. Rudyard Kipling's poem, If, comes to mind. Sharing the poem 
as I share the poem, think about joy. If, Ruya Kipling, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance to their doubting too, if you can or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good, not talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumphs and disaster and treat them, those two imposters, just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trip a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and loss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breath a word, breathe, sorry, a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, if neither foe nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can feel the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distant run, Yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. George Edward Curry was a man. The preceding is a poem that describes the very best of us, I dare say that few of us measure up, but George Curry did. He was the, the same last Saturday as he was when I knew him as a student at Druid High School, as a football player, as a frequent guest in Coach Mims's and my home, an outstanding journalist, publisher, and a big brother and family man as a friend as he moved on the world stage. Having been all around, he rose to the pinnacle of success, but he remained true to his roots, true to himself, and true to the voice God embedded in him. Druid High School classmates, schoolmates, would you join me in standing? We salute George Edward Curry. We appreciate the life and the legacy he has left us. 
thank you and thank Almighty God for his beautiful creation. Amen. Pulpit guests, good afternoon. Class of 65, you all know I have the gift to gab. Hey. <laughs> Hi, Ann. All of you all, we're so glad that, to, uh, to be here to celebrate the homegoing of George. And it says it's time to reflect. I see Uncle Buddy and he didn't know that. And people, I am kin to them as well, so I'm speaking from my heart. I didn't write anything down. But this is to let you know how much we love George. George was the same today as he was yesterday. And what I remember best is we had our big 50th last year, and we always, always had him to come and talk. And he would say, well, what, what, what what's your, your feeling? We say, we'll, we'll give you a big thank you. Which is what we always did. We never, we never paid him anything but much love. <laughs> which he gave back to us. Uh, I, and the, the one thing that stood out the most on all, sometimes people get up and they grow and they forget where they come from. He want you to know how much we love you, how much we are praying for you, and that we loved George, and he loved the class of 65, and he loved Drew and I graduates. Thank you. Remarks. However, as the president of class of 65, I'm honored to be here. I was saddened uh, when I got the call on the last Saturday and, uh, well, I won't go into that. I don't want to get emotional here. Uh, but we had some plans that we wanted to uh, do uh, and I, we had spoken last year about something that we thought was something that we needed to do to, to help the situation with our young brothers. And we had talked about what we could do that would really be of a benefit, uh, that could stop some of the things that lead us into a system of incarceration. And one of those things was a driver's license. Most of the time, we get stopped by the police for an insignificant offense and because we don't have a driver's license we get into the system with driving without a license which means that you can get searched your car could be taken from you they can search the entire contents of the car and you just may have some items in that car that may not need to be discovered and if you had a driver's license you wouldn't have had the problem of having your vehicle searched so we talked about a driver's license restoration program that we could uh, do nationwide. And as a person, a retired judge, uh, who knew something about the legal system, we were going to try to get together and set this up nationwide so that we could stop that initial contact that lead most of these young men that we have into the system. And something that I'm going to continue to work on and something that I'm going to ask all of you for help. <laughs> so, uh, Ann, it's so nice to see you again. Mrs. Curry, I know you don't remember me, but I used to visit you and George and Mackenzie Court. 
many, many years ago. Of course, uh, you couldn't recognize me now because I was so much younger. <laughs> but you're looking good. So it's a pleasure to see all of you. And I'm sorry that we're meeting under certain uh, circumstances, but I just wanted you to know that George was still working to the very end to do something very significant for all of us. So on behalf of class of 65, I'm honored to be his class member. I uh, used to kid him all the time about him being our academic all-American quarterback. <laughs> we had such good times together, such good memories, and I will cherish them for the remainder of my life. And hopefully I can accomplish that last thing that he and I talked about with this restoration pro driver's license restoration program. And I'll be in contact with some of you concerning it. And George, we will miss you. Good evening, everyone. George Corey left a long and great legacy. One of his favorite artists, James Brown, <laughs> right, had a song which describes that legacy. Ain't it funky? <laughs> Ain't it funky? Right? But George E. Curry, the man affectionately known in my household as Papa, right? You've run, you've run your race, and you've run it well. You left us with a legacy from your work and accomplishments that showed us that every man and woman has the opportunity to do great work, especially when they have a love and a passion for it. W.E.B. Du Bois, once said, all art is propaganda, ever, and ever must it be. Despite the waning of purists, I stand in utter shamelessness and say that whatever art I have for writing has been used always for propaganda, for gaining the right of black folk to love and enjoy. I do not care a bit for any art that is not used for propaganda. I can say that George Curry lived that to perfection through his work and his publications, right? But I'm not here today to talk about that part. I'm here to talk about what I knew about George Curry, the man, the man whom loved unconditionally, the man who inspired many youth to strive for better education, the man whom showed people that it was possible to travel the world and learn other cultures. The man who never missed a commitment. A man who was a great example to all. You see, when he traveled abroad, he wrote postcards to many, many youth. Handwritten postcards from wherever he was to let them know where he was at. Something to inspire them to let them know that they could get further than where they were. <laughs> and he brought back souvenirs for those youth. Right? He had multiple incentive-laced reward programs out there for the young children for educational performances. When they came close to those goals, he still would incentivize them to let them know that there's someone out there supporting you in your task. He committed to making sure that my children had a special relationship with him, never missing one engagement that he promised to make. George, Papa Curry, you were living proof that being in love and dedicated to one's craft can make a difference in the world. You were living proof that by opening one's heart, even to those that aren't blood related, 
you can make a difference in the world. I have no doubt that if everyone in here could commit themselves to following his footsteps with the same amount of dedication and love and work, right, family and society, that this world would be a much better place. Fare you well, Papa, and thank you for being the inspiration you have been to so many. I can only hope to have a legacy as deep and as, and as meaningful as yours one day when I meet you on the other shore. Thank you. Thank you for being that inspiration. Thank you for the challenge that you have set forth for me to follow in those footsteps. Good evening. When I was around eight or nine years old, I went with Aunt Liz and Uncle George out to eat after my cousin's graduation. Perhaps precocious, but a bit shy at times and a lot socially awkward, with Uncle George's encouragement, I was electric sliding with vigor right in the middle of that restaurant. With him cheering me on, I was unafraid of who might see. When I was around 10 years old, Uncle George began to send me a postcard every time he traveled to a new city in the world. Now mind you, this was way before this Bama country boy had any sense of the expansive nature of the world or any conception that I could travel in it. I learned about places that I had never known existed and was able to imagine through my uncle's numerous geographic excursions that I could be a world traveler too. When I applied to the Selective Performing Arts High School I attended in Birmingham, Alabama, I distinctly remember Uncle George's confidence that I would get in. A confidence, by the way, that I did not have in my own ability. Once I matriculated, Uncle George could be counted on to be at every single one of my performances, no matter how demanding his schedule was or how far he had to travel to be there. Another time, I remember a DC visit my family made when I was about 15. I told Uncle George I liked his cologne, the Armani Code fragrance that was his signature. Without a thought, he gave me the bottle and I didn't even wear cologne at the time. <laughs> Finally, as apprehensive as I was about applying to Duke University in the early decision pool, when I told Uncle George, he wondered why I had not applied to more prestigious universities so that I could have the option to choose which one I wanted to attend. You see, Uncle George was a shining force in my life, in my intellectual trajectory, and in my development as an ethical being because of who he was as a person. And what is ironic about this is that his confidence is that his influence on me had very little to do with his tremendous journalistic hand. It was his will to be present and supportive in my life, his rambunctious and infectious laughter, the precision with which he could do a scarily accurate impersonation of just about anyone, including James Brown, not an award or accolade that made him so special to me. Despite all of his world travels, the numerous publications, celebrity associates, he remained just Uncle George. I walked into one of my mentor's offices at the Mary Lou Williams Center for Black Culture at Duke on Monday, and asked her whether she had ever heard the name George Curry. The George Curry, she asked? Emerge Magazine George Curry? Of course I know the brother that was our black Twitter before black Twitter existed. <laughs> she went on for several minutes detailing to me the force with which my Uncle George changed black journalism and public intellectualism as we know it. So given this newly informed history with which I can now reflect on my uncle's legacy to the world, it is now incredibly affirming to know that I have always stood on his shoulders. As the president of the Black Student Alliance on my campus this past year, 
I'd like to think I honored his legacy without my even knowing it. Uncle George made it very clear to me that he was proud of the work that I did as an activist and community advocate, but the consistent and important lessons he taught me were about interpersonal relationship building, about courage, about love, and about family. And so I hope that each of you will take this celebration of my uncle's incredible life as a call to action to advocate on behalf of marginalized people in the world. And I also hope that it will cause you to consider how your character and your spirit impact the people around you. What is it that you have done this month to demonstrate that black lives and the lives of other oppressed people in the world matter to you? How have you used your gifts to make an impact on the world and in people's lives? Did your kindness make anyone smile? The George Curry, my uncle, was willing to be the change he wanted to see in the world. And you owe it to his legacy and to your own to do the very same. Thank you. Good evening. Ah, put it on my phone because I can't read my own handwriting. So, There are a lot of ideas about what the true purpose of life is. Some believe we're on this planet to make as many friends as we can or to make as much money as we possibly can. Some people think that we need to accomplish something that will leave a legacy. And some think that the best legacy a person can leave is their family. No matter what you believe the purpose of life to be, one thing that will help you succeed is if you approach life as something to be enjoyed. And if you ever spent one second with my Uncle George Curry, you knew he was somebody who not only enjoyed life, but helped the people around him enjoy life too. Whether it was a call or an email, his mission was to let us know that he cared. He never missed a graduation my high school graduation, my sister's high school graduation, my college graduation, my sister's college graduation, never missed one. Didn't know where he came from, didn't know what city he was in at the time, usually coming from a speaking engagement or something like that, but he always showed up, him and Ann, and whatever fancy camera was out at the time, <laughs> them two trying to figure out how to use it. Going back through his articles, there's one common theme between, there's a common theme between most of them. Number one, whenever he could, he always mentioned where he was from, where he grew up, and at least one family member's name, almost every article, even Aunt Cat. It was, and his articles were rarely about himself. They were always about others, always about helping others. I don't think we need to go into details about the Kimba Smith situation and how he helped her um, through his publications and work getting her off of a 24-year jail sentence, um, which was a very big deal. He said that was one of the highlights of his career. Besides my father, Iverson Jr., I'd have to say that Uncle George was by far one of my biggest role models, mainly because we shared a lot in common. We both grew up in Alabama. We both love telling people that we grew up in Alabama. We both would do almost anything to get a laugh. We both settled down in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. We both loved being black. And most importantly, we both took orders from Susan Carroll Polk Gandy. <laughs> Growing up in Alabama, being black can mean a lot of different things, depending on how you choose to take it. As I got older, I learned that sometimes it's more convenient in certain circles or conversations to not do anything to remind people that you are, in fact, black. Way easier to just blend in. George Curry didn't believe in that. The same Uncle George that hosted one of the inauguration balls when President Obama was first elected, 
was the same Uncle George telling jokes about Sue Baby in my grandmother's kitchen with everybody's head and stomachs hurting from laughing so much. He walked the same, he talked the same, and he was always looking out for family and always looking out for the black community as a whole, unapologetically. He never apologized for being black. In the editor's note for that November 96 issue of Clarence Thomas on the cover, one of two, Uncle George apologized for not treating Thomas even more harshly than he did. And I quote, even our latest depiction is too compassionate for a person who has done so much to turn back the clock on civil rights all the way back to the pre-Civil War lawn jockey days. That's what he said about a Supreme Court justice, the highest court in the land, a position that you die in. He said that. And that's the kind of man that he was. Another thing that I think goes unnoticed about Uncle George is that although he was not what we consider an old timer, he embraced technology and the future probably more than anyone else in his peer group. In fact, I had the honor of creating his first website, and that was in 1999, when you had to have two phone lines, one for the phone and one for the dial-up internet that you had to listen to with the AOL 50 free hours that you kept getting in the mail and doing it over and over and over again. And we worked on that website, which was something that was not a very common thing for a normal person to have done back then. I remember at that same inauguration ball that he got myself and my date free tickets to he was talking to a gentleman about Restart and Emerge, and this particular man sounded like he was trying to get Uncle George leaning more towards continuing to write for the publications that he was writing and not necessarily try to bring the magazine back. And he says something along the lines of, you know, George, everything that glitters ain't gold. And Uncle George said, I know, like glitter. And those were the time, types of things that he would say on a normal basis. And we walked away, and he said, a smart man, and I told my dad this, a smart man knows that a tomato is a fruit. A wise man knows it still don't go in no fruit salad. <laughs> I'm going to get my magazine back. And that's what he said, and he did. As we all know, Uncle George loved Nelson Mandela and his family and they loved him. So I thought it would be fitting to end with a few of Mandela's words. And as I read these, this couple of sentences, it sounds like it could have been written for Uncle George specifically. Nelson Mandela said, death is something inevitable. When a man has done what he considers to be his duty to his country and his people, he can rest in peace. I believe I have made that effort, and that is, therefore, why I will sleep for the eternity. I was there Saturday, me and Ann. And he died doing what he loved, working, working on Emerge. So although his body is gone, those we love never truly leave us. His legacy is something that not even death can touch. They say a person's true wealth is the good he or she does in the world. So I think we can all agree George Curry died a rich man. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know, my name is Lynn Stewart. I'm his cousin, and like he used to affectionately call me cousin agent, because I was his agent for a while, and he also affectionately called me Lindbergh. 
Uh, that was his nickname for me. So I want to say this to the family, which is my family, and to the audience. I'm going to try to say some things that maybe some of you don't know about George, because for years he and I traveled together. We went from Miami to Seattle, everywhere, and then we're in between. So, so I want to say this. I definitely want to let y'all know this. Before I knew what a stand-up comedian was, that's what he was. I found reunions were something of a joyous time. Everybody wanted to come in Johnson City, where we had a family. Everybody in Johnson City wanted to come. Everybody wanted to come and just hear George. Man, that was so funny to me and my, my brothers uh, growing up. And he'd always say, at my grandmother, Mr. G. May Cousin would always get on him afterwards and say, he shouldn't have said it. He said, well, what did I say that wasn't true? What did I say that wasn't true? And nobody could ever say anything. So as I got older, one of the things that he and I spoke about, and I'm glad someone said something about Mackenzie Court. He did love Mackenzie Court. He taught me more about Mackenzie Court than I knew about the housing development where I come from in John C. Tennessee, <laughs> which he stayed in when he was in college when he used to come home from Knoxville College. And one of the things they told me about Mackenzie Court that was fascinating me, because I used to ask questions, and I stayed there with Mark Martha Lee, his mother, Sometimes when I was younger, if we came in from Johnson City, he would say, man, you, you just don't know. So I said, cuz, explain to me, man, like, what was it like? Because, you know, because I work with young people and I work with uh, 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 people on subsidized housing and so forth. And I was like, what was it like when I moved to McKenzie Court? He said, man, it was a step up. <laughs> I said, it was? He's like, man, it was a step up. He said, man, I thought I was in the White House. He said, man, we had a brick home running. What I said, dude, it was, he said, man, it was a step up. And just that him reflecting on that like that made me feel differently about my condition growing up. Not that we were that poor that I remember, but me and him used to laugh because one time my Aunt Martha Lee, his mother, came to John City during Christmas holiday, and I was maybe third, fourth grade. And she came in and saw a Christmas tree and the presents, and the first thing she said, her and George, like, y'all have got to be the richest, poorest folks I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and that stuck with me. I remember, I was like, richest, poorest, what does that mean? Well, I found out years later what that really meant, because he and I discussed it when we were on a trip somewhere. Because I would bring up different stuff to him. I found, you know, I have a pretty vivid memory. And I would bring up different things to him. And one of the things that we spoke about in, in relation to that was, he used to wear, he still does, a clasp, a gold bracelet, silver, with a hook on it for a door, to keep a door shut. And I asked him one time, like, man, where did you come from? Man, it reminds me where I came from. I was like, why, what do you mean? He said, man, just keep a door shut. Man, it reminds me. So he said, man, you need to always have something that reminds you of where you came from. And I was like, well, man, maybe you're right. I didn't think about it. He said, man, you know, you come from where I come from. And he, to make that clear, he even sent me the DNA results they took to let me know where I family really come from, from my heritage in Africa, as far as DNA is concerned. He made sure I knew that. I was like, wow, okay. Dude. So without him knowing it, and I never had a chance to tell him, I dug in my closet one night to find what was given to me when I went to college, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, in 1985. I keep that with me as a reminder, because my cousin George wanted to make sure, never forget where you come from. My grandmother gave me these because she had no money to give me at the time when I went to college. And I kept it. And she said to me, God, God, are you embarrassed to use that? I was like, I, I don't know. Even though we've been on food stamps whole life. I'm like, I, I don't know. We'll see. The point I'm trying to make is he cared about family. He was deeply concerned and cared about our family. Every conversation we had on the phone, every conversation was always about family. We talked more and more and more. Every conversation, there was something about family. And he wanted the family to always be together. And let me give you an example. Uh, my cousin Iverson spoke about family, how he looked out for us. He and I went to the Million Man March together. We were with the BET. We were, on, we were on the last van going to the Million Man March. So by the time we got there, it was a million people. And I was like, wow, man, y'all going to air here in, a, here in a second. You know, what are we going to eat? Man, we got to make it up there by the CNN booth, which is where the BET booth was. And I was like, dude, we're not going to make it. So he had his Emerge jacket on. He always had this Emerge jacket. So somebody in the crowd recognized him and said, man, this is George Curry for Emerge. And literally, the crowd split. And I was looking like, man, 
So I'm standing there looking, and there was a big wall or something we had to go up. And they picked him up and lifted him up with a wall, and he said, don't forget about my cousin, Lynn. And they came and got me and lifted me up too, and we turned around and looked, and looked at the crowd. And see, I'm used to going to football games, University of Tennessee, so I know what 100,000 look like. So I know what a million looks like, because I can do the math. And we turned around and looked, he and I, and I was like, wow. Man, there's over a million people here. He's like, cuz, man, isn't this something? I said, wow, man, this is amazing. I said, he said, this is what I'm talking about. This is the exposure I want everyone to have. I want everybody to know what this is about. And saying that, part of his legacy, I was interviewed in Nashville the other day about his legacy. And I told the story, I'm not sure how many people know this, of course, everybody know, if you don't, you should, about the Kimber Smith story. And George used to always send me articles from Emerge about two months before they even came out, just to get my opinion, like, what do you think, what's happening? So this particular article, he's like, hey, man, I need you to read this, and read it to the kids you work with, make sure they know. I was like, wow. So that's, that's what he taught me about the conspiracy law, and I started researching conspiracy law, and I was like, wow. Like, man, this, I said, George, this is going to be an award winner right here. Well, from there, the National News picked it up. A lot of things happened throughout the next year, and I was, um, uh, today's my first day meeting Kimba, and I met her dad some years earlier at Fisk when I picked him up and took him to the airport and did some things. But the day that Clinton signed her pardon papers, he called me because I was on my way home to Johnson City, Tennessee, and he was crying. So I'm thinking something wrong. I couldn't understand what he was saying. I was like, what's going on? He said, man, he wouldn't believe it. He's crying. I was like, what's wrong? He said, man, something wrong with the family? He's like, man, the White House just called. I'm like, man, they're keeping tabs on us like that. He's like, no, man, they just signed the pardon paper to Kimber Smith. He was crying. He said, man, that's what I want. He said, that's, that's what I need. And he said, man, that's what I work for. To help out people like, he said, man, that's what, that's what it's all about. I'm like, wow. Man, it touched me so deep. And he, was, he couldn't stop crying. And it brought me tears as I was driving. So I just want you to know that that's how much he cared. And also, as far as our, our travel, as far as the family, everywhere we went, He'd always say, man, I want family to have this same experience. And as we, both of us, have gotten older, and he called me not too long ago, last year, me and he was talking on the phone, he said, man, why don't you call me that much anymore? I said, well, what, you have Ann. I ain't, I ain't got to call and keep tabs you no more, Ann's got you. And he just laughed, and he just laughed. I said, man, that's just the way it is. And we spoke about the times in McKenzie Court when we used to come down when I was a kid and visit, and Charlotte and Chris and Sue would take me and my brothers around, and do different things with this. He's like, man, you remember those times? He said, man, wasn't those some good times? I was like, man, what I can remember it was. He's like, man, never forget anything. And me and him laughed about this story. And you had to know one of my uncles, great uncles, was his uncle, my Uncle Percy. Uncle Percy was always, not always, how can I put it? He wasn't always around where you could find him all the time. So if you saw him, make sure you talk to him. Because <laughs> you may not see him again for a while. So one day, when we were in Tuscaloosa here, it was me, George, his mother, my Uncle Buddy who's here, my Uncle Frank, God rest his soul, my grandfather, Hart's cousin, my grandmother, G. May, God rest her soul, Uncle Henry, Aunt Catherine. We were all sitting on my Aunt, my Aunt Catherine's porch, who we fixed on his Aunt Cat. We were sitting on her porch. And Percy was drinking a beer, and my grandmother didn't allow that. And I said, boy, you ain't drinking no beer. He snatched the beer out of his hand. Now the person ran out the porch. Now the person's like, why are you getting my beer? And he's supposed to drink no beer in his porch. He said, look, Big Mama told you to take care of me until she come back. And you're not doing a good job at it. The reason I say that, Big Mama had died before I was even born. When Uncle Percy said that, George and I laughed. And everybody on the porch fell out laughing because they were so out of the ordinary. And George said, see, that's a family reunion moment that a lot of people miss out on. And he used to write little notes for the next family reunion just in case so he can bring those things up. But in closing, I want to say this about George that maybe some of you don't know. He was a lover of hip hop, not old school. That was just what he did. And he always wanted to make sure that people cared about him. And I want to thank who's in the audience today. If I miss anybody, please forgive me. Mr. Roland Martin, who did a nice special on him on TV One. I know the family appreciate that, I appreciate it. So I just want to remember my cousin, my loved one, our family member, Mr. George Curry.
Thank you so much. Let the church say amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. We just want to thank this lovely family. I have the esteemed honor in introducing my good friend, Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. And I can honestly say that he and George Curry and I they had a very special relationship. You know, George and I travel the world together. And Miss Martha Curry Brownlee, you know how close George and I were. And you used to tease us as his mother and said, Charles, I give up on you and George. I'm going to call your brother Danny. <laughs> He's my brother. And we always had fun and with the family. Susan called me. Um, I was speaking in Denver, Colorado last Saturday night and talked to Charlotte and Susan. I was going to the poor pit to speak and my wife texted me and said, urgent, my brother Danny, urgent call. That's when I got the, the announcement what had happened and George had died. But the point being is that we were all family Susan and I talked, I cried like a baby in the airport. Charlotte called me, I called Charlotte. And, and Ms. Brownlee has always been the glue. George will always tell me about you. But George and I was in Paris and he started talking about Reverend Jesse Jackson. And George was a hard worker, as you mentioned. The hardest working man you will ever find, eh? You know that. And he and Ann and I and my wife, my, my first lady of SCLC, he's with me. Ann and Annette and George and I had the best of fun. So I was in Paris and George and I traveled the world together. And we were coming back from Cote d'Ivoire, Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, West Central Africa. And he said, man, let's spend two or three days in in Paris, because we, we were going to Paris twice a month. We were doing a project, big project. I said, okay, George, so we were going to dinner. We have a lot of friends in Paris. And they was taking us out to dinner, and they was asking George about Reverend Jesse Jackson. Said, uh, George, said, we know Charles work hard. Said, how does Reverend Jesse Jackson work? And you got to know George to hear George Curry stories. He said, well, Charles is a hard worker, but I guarantee you at 1 o'clock, he going to bed. <laughs> I'll go all the world with Charles. Charles and I go all over the world, but he's going to bed at 1 o'clock. He said, Reverend Jesse Jackson going to go all over Berlin, go all over Paris, Brussels, Belgium, and all these foreign countries, and all he's, he's looking for is a light, a light in a church. <laughs> and if Reverend Jesse Jackson see a light in a church, we're going to pull the bus over and he's going to go in and we're going to go in and we'll have church for two hours. I said, well, George, what if you are in Brussels, Belgium, or you, you are in Berlin, or George and I was even in Torino, Italy. I said, what if you're in Italy? They don't, they don't understand the language. They, they don't speak English. He said, it doesn't matter. With Reverend Jesse Jackson, they always give him a standing ovation. Ladies and gentlemen, our friend, our brother, to commemorate our good friend, George Curry, my brother, the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. Give it to him. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. In the name of Christ, I greet you tonight with a great sense of responsibility and in a very heavy heart tonight. Sister Martha, don't, don't, don't you think that this frees you from the promised potato pie? You still must do your potato pie business. Get that part down. We have um, last Friday night, Saturday morning, I think Roland Martin worked all night long calling everybody. And then after about the second call, everybody was calling him back. Did you know George is a transition center, a shockwave throughout the press around the whole world. 
They were calling in South Africa, and they were calling in Paris, and they were calling way down in Mississippi. They were calling about George. George meant that much. It means that much to all of us. And I want to thank you so much for being the companion that you were to George and the source of joy and love that you represent to him and to how he shared families. I want to thank the journalists who are here. Some are coming in tonight from around the world. Journalists who are here present stand journalists. Then give them a hand, please. <laughs> this is one of our busy seasons of work. I was in Baton Rouge last weekend hearing about the the flood in many ways more damaging than Katrina. Katrina was in kind of one spot in the Ninth Ward, but the flood in Baton Rouge covers 23 parishes. And it's not a flood zone, and so people they were uh, trapped in the flood without flood insurance for the most part. Uh, and then they would get a, uh, an adjustment figure of 90,000 uh, and, and the FEMA would give 8,000 8, and then they had to pay the house note nonetheless. And that didn't deal with those who were renting, uh, those who were uh, homeless in the first place. We were trapped there. I heard about George and I made the river go high with my own on tears and then rushed off to yesterday in Detroit at the A. Philip Randolph Institute National Convention. And this morning, uh, Seville, the young man who was killed in um, Milwaukee, we did his services today uh, in Milwaukee. And I couldn't make it tomorrow because of the Baton Rouge situation. And so I got a private plane. I was determined to be in some part of this service and I could not say no I wanted to say yes and thank you for allowing me to participate with the family on this occasion and then Sister Martha and Susan and so forth. We thank you so very much. And then on to this August 28th is this Sunday, the anniversary of the March on Washington led by Dr. King. And so our hearts are heavy and yet we rejoice. Let us bow our heads and pray. We thank you so much for so much. You've given us a lot, and yet with each other we have a lot left. Search our hearts and know our ways and make us better and more fit for the journey. Forgive us for any reasonable doubt that we have about your judgment. You brought him and you called him home to be in your arms, to be in your bosom. Thank you for the family. Thank you for the upbringing. Thank you for his knowledge of thee. Thank you for his word, for his skills, for his spreading the joy. We know we fall down. We get back up again, over and over again, because we are not made for the ground, yet we rise anyhow. We rise, we rise, we rise, and we get up because nothing is too hard for you. And the ground is no place for our champion, George. Our champion, we thank you, George. Even now, you're with us. You, you will... You will live as long as we remember you, and we will not forget. You will live as long as we remember you, and we will not forget. Amen. 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 I was trying to figure out something of some liberty after I heard Lynn speak. Lynn talked just like George. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn, got, Lynn, you stand up again, Lynn. You got a lot of George in you. Let, Lynn got to say something to Mark, because that's George one more time. Stand up, Lynn. Give him a big hand. <laughs> Y'all are cousins. We were in Central Africa someplace one night and talking about when your time comes, what well, you want people to say over you. And people are giving various virtues. And George say, when I send over me and say, he getting up. <laughs> <laughs> he will get up one day. I chose to write my words down tonight because I didn't want to run the risk of not saying anything other than what I want to say. I'm dedicated to George Curry, product of his work. And Sister Martha and family, I thank you so much. If when you give the best of your service, he will say, well done. Job said, when my worst fears come upon me, I know that my Redeemer lives because he lives in my soul. Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Death cannot break the bonds between George and God and his family. 
And those who came know him and who came to love him. George left at 69, Will thought the king at 39, and Malcolm at 39, and Jesus at 33. He served his time. Tonight, George's life was called forth an unplanned family reunion, and tomorrow you will hear so many people, Reverend Sharp and others, make the case for George's life, what he means to us, people flying in from all around the world tomorrow, and I thank them for remembering George and giving support for his family. We're not here tonight because George died, but because he lived. Because what he injected into us. The reality we face tonight is that life is uncertain and death is. With our tools, we negotiate life's challenges and hardships. We finally run out of negotiating space and God calls us home. George was born in radical segregation. At a time when we could not use the hotel in Tuscaloosa, the motel, the library, the public park benches. George was born when we could not aspire to attend the University of Alabama, and we could not roll with the tide while living and raised in Tuscaloosa. Born in segregation, but he did not internalize it. He was born in a time of two birds. Tuscaloosa had two birds. The eagle flew on one side of town with the power to fly high, Without limitation, look in the noonday sun, the other side of town, the Jim Crow flew. He did, not, he did not bite Jim Crow, and his presence did not scare him. He was not afraid of Jim nor Crow. He mastered his environment. George was an odds buster and a dream maker. You have no choice to who you were born, nor to whom you were born, nor the conditions under which you were born. You have to negotiate with what you have to work with. He was born having to play baseball with a short stick. Some, where the eagles fly, inherit home runs. They're born with scores before they ever go to bat. Some are born on third base as if they hit a triple. If you were denied the bat, denied the spikes, denied the equipment, and play on rocket fields, but still score their dream makers and their odds busters, they are George Curry. Born behind the walls of segregation, before Rosa Parks sat in, Dr. King proclaimed, before Arthur and Lucid was scored in the University of Alabama by the military, he was born with a low ceiling. A law could not stand upright, a dream upright, a hope upright. Somehow George blossomed in the cracks. One day while taking a morning walk, Brother Steele down the sidewalk, two blocks of cement that barely pulled apart. In the cracks, which were supposed to be covered, there was grass growing in the cracks. The soil was supposed to have covered the ground by the cement, but in the crack was just enough fertile soil and water for the seed to blossom into grass and flower. Many of us grow up in the cracks. We take the best of what God has given us and move on to higher ground. George came through the cracks. Life finds a way. Sometimes genius is found in the cracks. Not far from here, Willie Mays and Hank Aaron and Bo Jackson came out of the cracks. Became the best at their chosen profession. They came out of the cracks. As you come into consciousness, realize tight space and adjust. What do you do when you find yourself in the crack? Well, you can either one, adjust and find your space in the crack and rationalize it and develop a crack complex. Or you can resent it and become embittered and just survive, but never change and realize your potential. Just be bitter all your life. Or you can resist. Something within you can ordain you to make crooked ways straight. It said that the arc of the universe bends to adjust, but you must rise up and grab the arc and bend it toward justice. If the door of justice is too big for you to get open, you should at least leave a footprint. You try to kick it open, but you never surrendered. In George's formative years, before he was a teenager, he heard the stories of 5,000 lynchings between 1880 and 1940. 5,000 lynchings. Most blacks went to Chicago and went to New York uh, not looking for a job. They went by, as refugees driven out the South by lynching. George grew up in the, his service about the Scottsboro Boys. 
But in George's crack was a mother and parents who hovered over their little eaglet, whispered in his ear that he was neither, ro neither crow nor buzzard. He was an eagle that he could fly anyhow. Nurtured at home, cultivated at Oxford College, the school of Vernon Jarrett and Michael Dyson. George was maladjusted and restless with indignity. He learned that literacy was a key to liberation. In the shadows of the University of Alabama, he was re the rejected stone. But at Knoxville College, he became the cornerstone of a new order and became chairman of its board. I met George in 1980 when we were conducting a boycott on Budweiser, opening up the beverage industry. George was writer and interpreter for the St. Louis Post. And we won that battle because George was writer and interpreter. George was a freedom fighting journalist. In 1984, during our first campaign for the presidency, George had the ability, the integrity, the first wave of black journalists on that tour at that time. And, and the white journalists challenged their integrity as writers. That was the last time they did it. They met, they met the other side of, they met the other D in George. <laughs> Ma'am, George had more than four Ds, I think you need to know. <laughs> he had some other Ds too. Dad, blame it. For example, what made George different? For those who are watching and listening tonight, and young and not so, first of all, as I listened to his English teacher with very sensitive language and watch his young nephew, George had a good mind. Didn't come from way up north in New York, didn't come from way out west in LA, came from Tuscaloosa where he was, got what books were left, programmed to not learn, with lower expectation. George had a good mind. His mind outlived his body. He died with his shoes on. He was physically strong. He could work long hours, do research, and travel the world. We went to Japan and Morocco and South Africa and France and Britain. He was able, he had a good mind and a strong body. He had the courage of his conviction. He did not follow opinion polls, he molded opinion. George had a point of view. He would challenge the publishers. George had a point. He was never fired. You can't find somebody on a mission. George had a point of view. His mission was greater than, than his job. Say his mission. His mission was greater than his job. When the walls closed down, he, he knew how to move. He had, he had scientific objectivity. He could see people as they were, not as he would have them be. George had a good mind, a, a strong body, and had courage. George had confidence in black people. When we did well, George was never surprised. He was always delighted. He knew with the Olympic rules we could get the gold medal. And I watched those kids get those gold medals last week. I watched President Barack come across that stage as America's president. It was because we knew if we had the right conditions, we could always make it. Why are we so good at the University of Alabama as football players today? Or Auburn, or, or South Carolina is the case, maybe. We say whenever, say whenever, the playing field is even and the rules are public and the goals are clear and the referee is fair and the score is transparent, we can make it. Say nothing. Is wrong with us, some is wrong with the cookie cutter. Now, some of you better crocker people wouldn't understand this, but uh, you make a, a batter of dough, and it looks like what you put it in. If you put it in where the animal cook it, one like an elephant, like a it, the, the, the taste the same, but it looks, say it looks like what you put it in. We're cultivated with low ceilings. Sometime we're bent over, but our minds must never bend. Our character must never bend. Our hearts must never give out. It gets dark sometimes. But even if it's dark, you can study in the dark. 
You can pray in the dark. You can vote in the dark. You can think in the dark. Somebody says it's dark, but the morning cometh. The Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? The Lord is the source of our strength. He is our rock. He is our rose of Sharon. He is our bright and morning star. He is our grace, and grace is sufficient. Our God is a mighty God. Too good to let us suffer too long, and too wise to make a mistake. So we submit George to God tonight. God gave George to us, we give George back to God. And say he was gripping with, should I go to the hospital or not? But what we learn from this is if when you give the best of your service, attend the role that the Savior has come. You may not be believed, but if when you give the best, God will say, well done. The righteous judge will say, well, George, you made us better. You spanned our, 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 our vistas, you made us better. You told our story. You made us writers and thinkers. You showed us how. You are a man for days. We thank you, George. If when you give the best, and you gave your best, and we thank you, we're in your debt. You're the creditor, we're the debtor. God bless you, George. See you on the shore soon. Well, let's praise God again for Dr. Jesse Jackson. And we do recognize the Frat Brothers accused on your stand. Thank you. Let's thank God for them. We have the cues. <laughs> Judge England in the back. Other elected officials, you here? We just stand. The remainder of these services will take place tomorrow at uh, William Mary Baptist Church at 11 o'clock at 2701 20th Street. <laughs> As the band who's in steel will come, well, let us all stand and sing, We Shall Overcome. So come on, lead it. Go ahead. Go ahead.
Christian Steele, you need to say something?